So, wir kommen dann zum letzten Vortrag und es ist mir eine sehr große Freude, Angela Day anzukündigen. Ähm, Angela Day erhielt 2013 ihren Bachelorabschluss in Informatik an der Princeton University in New York und schloss 2018 ihre Promotion in Informatik an der Stanford University ab. Sie kam dann zunächst als Postdoc an die TU München, wo sie seit 2019 im Rahmen eines Junior Research Group Awards eine Nachwuchsforschergruppe leitet. Seit 2020 ist sie Professorin an der TU München und leitet dort das 3 AI Lab. Frau Day erhielt zahlreiche Auszeichnungen, angefangen 2009 mit dem Shapiro Prize for Academic Excellence der Princeton University und 2011 einem ersten Platz in der Facebook College Hackathon Finals bis hin 2022 zu dem Google Research School Scholar Award und dem Eurographics Young Researcher Award der Eurographics Association for Computer Graphics. Und für den Vortrag werde ich jetzt auf, auf Englisch halten, so I will, or we will switch to English now. And Angela, I'm looking forward to your talk. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Angela, and it's my pleasure to give the last lecture uh, of today's events. Um, and we'll be discussing in English, I'm afraid. My, my German is too poor, so you have to forgive me. Um, and I'll be talking about how we can perceive 3D environments with AI. So, our world around us is three-dimensional, spatially, and so what my group looks into is how we can leverage AI in order to build up 3D representations from things like uh, cell phone images of real environments. So this is really critical for applications like in self-driving cars, where cars need to be able to see um, where exactly in space other cars, other people, um, and other cyclists are on, on the street. And they need to perceive in 3D rather than just in 2D, because then um, otherwise they don't know where exactly they are in space. So for robots, they need to be able to also uh, move and interact in this um, 3D environment. We want to uh, know where objects are, how to pick them up, how to, to use them, and that requires having a 3D map of their environment because, of course, we want to be able to make robots learn about how humans themselves interact with their environments and, and make robots more human-like in their understanding of real scenes. So we also have a lot of um, applications in, in content creation, so creating um, 3D assets for things like video games. Um, all of these characters interact with their environments in a, in a 3D way. Um, or if we imagine having a shared virtual space um, and having interactions with uh, you know, um, virtual people in a real environment. So how do humans perceive 3D? Because we have depth perception, um, and that typically comes from the two eyes that we have, which are basically two cameras that allow us to see uh, the world and to estimate um, and localize and visualize how far away objects are from, from each other. So we can take that kind of... Um, inspiration into how we can allow machines to see. Uh, and this is um, a depth sensor, so that means that it's capturing not just color, like you typically would get off of a cell phone, but it's capturing also depth. So at every pixel here, you see there's a depth from the camera that's being estimated. So that allows us to do things like figure out how to merge all of these measurements together that recreate a 3D environment uh, that's being observed here. And so this, with this, we can create 3D models of real environments just by taking these uh, video camera measurements around. So that's pretty cool. And we can do this, in fact, even in, all right. Sorry, 
the video doesn't play, but this will, it's uh, a real-time reconstruction approach. Um, and you can get out the uh, actual reconstructions of, uh, this is the office that I used to uh, work in. And so you can, can capture these 3D models of uh, all of the environments. Um, you would have seen previously that was the apartment that I used to live in. But um, so here we can recognize uh, the 3D structures of these real spaces. But there's a bit of a problem here with even this kind of nice reconstruction, which is that we're missing a lot of geometry if we just turn it around and inspect it at a close view. So this is because of a lot of different reasons. Um, and in practice, it's very difficult to get complete geometry measurements from real scenes because you can't just uh, physically move the sensor around to capture everything. There are always objects that are blocking other objects. And what that means when we try to put a virtual avatar into the scene, it doesn't know where to go. Um, it doesn't know the full interactions of the geometry. So it's, it's not a complete reconstruction of the environment. So uh, just a very brief overview how um, uh, most deep learning kind of machine learning methods work. They're usually operating in a supervised learning setting which means that we have um, inputs and their, their targets that are available. So here for just recognizing what are these images, we know what, uh, we have the image as the input and the target is the label for what these objects are. And we have that information given to us to teach the machine how to perform this task. So the challenge is um, with 3D, understanding the geometry of 3D scenes, uh, we don't actually have that target label. This target reconstruction is incomplete, so it's not telling us how to fill in the holes. So now we have to reformulate that um, learning approach to be able to figure out how to understand geometry without ever having seen a complete reconstruction of a scene because we, we can't, in, in practice, capture them. So this... Uh, 3D reconstruction has originally been constructed with a bunch of depth frames that you saw before from these kinds of sensors. Um, and what we can do is a clever little trick to uh, say, well, we can take away half of the, um, the frames and make a new scene. And now this one is more incomplete. It's missing more geometry. And now we can correlate these two together as a pseudo input target. So the target is not completely correct because it's still missing some information. Uh, but we can understand the process that goes from less incomplete uh, to, to more complete. And in, in a sense, we also use some information from the camera here. So we can figure out where, where we don't know information because we know, um, let's say, if the camera sees a surface in front of it, in order for it to have seen that surface, there's nothing there uh, behind that surface. It doesn't know, and so these are the unobserved regions here. Um, and so we can formulate this instead of as fully supervised learning as self-supervised learning because we've created a formulation that allows um, the machine to be able to learn from the data without having extra labels required. So what this looks like when we run this on an incomplete scan, we can get out this nice prediction of geometry and it's got all of these holes filled in. So the cool thing is, compared to the target scan, actually the target scan in, in this scenario it was, has holes in it. So we can, in fact, learn to generate um, geometry of 3D scenes that's even more complete than any one example that we had in our original database. So you see here, there's a bunch of holes um, in the, the target scan information. And the machine learning approach here even allows us to learn how to complete these holes. So um, that, that's the cool part of this self-supervised formulation. And we understand geometric structure in this, in this way. So we can also apply this, of course, to colors, because usually you don't go out in the wild and you see a totally uncolored geometry. Right, usually we understand scenes with both color and geometry. Um, and this requires basically uh, interpreting the colors um, that we generate on the scenes from many different kind of views to compare to all of the original images that were, were captured. And what you can get out of that 
is a prediction here that estimates missing geometry and missing color from unobserved space. Uh, and, and we can produce these nice reconstructions that have complete color and geometry understanding of a real environment. So here you can see from an input partial scan, then we can produce both color and geometry to, to make this sort of realistic scene reconstruction. So it's probably fair to say that um, most of you guys don't necessarily have the ability to capture depth frames with just your cell phones. Uh, most people with cell phone kind of, they, they capture RGB images. So maybe we want to understand 3D structure from just a single image. It's just an RGB image, we don't even have a depth measurement, but we want to understand what is the 3D structure of all of the objects that we see in the images. So this is an, an ill-posed problem. Um, it's, it's like this thing uh, where you take a look at this um, visual illusion of this. Is it a, a crater or is it a dome? Uh, if you squint at it one way or the other, sometimes it looks like it goes down, sometimes it looks like it goes up. Uh, so this is an, an ambiguous scenario here because this image has been created from geometry, materials, lighting, um, and we have not enough uh, constraints here to, to fully solve it but we can make a good guess as people, um, and so we can take uh, machine learning in order to train machines in order to be able to also produce similar kind of good guesses. So when we take a look at an image here, we understand a lot about what objects are structured. You don't see all of the object geometry here, but you know that this is um, a kitchen island, it's probably shaped kind of like a rectangular prism, um, and you don't necessarily see all of the stools, but you can understand what the 3D structure of these stools look like. And so that's the kind of information that we want to use AI to um, give machines that kind of ability to also perceive the 3D structure of all of the objects that you see here in this image. And so the way that one way we can do that is to take advantage of the fact that there are large databases, actually, of uh, 3D shapes. So a lot of them, for instance, come from IKEA. Uh, and, and we can take that as a prior knowledge and take these shapes from the database and figure out how can we retrieve a similar shape from that database and align it with what we see here in the image. So. This is what, what you see here from an input image. We're detecting um, all of the objects in the image with um, a deep network here. And then we're associating all of these detected objects in the image with similar 3D shapes that represent the structure of that um, object. And then we can estimate in which position those shapes uh, need to be placed such that they're aligned with what we see in the image. So what that means is we're constructing this embedding space here where um, similar objects that are structured similarly, they lie close to each other even if they come from image or if they come from 3D. So these um, are round tables all clustered together despite that some of them come from the images, some of them come from shapes. Um, these ones are like bookshelf tables and they all cluster together, which means that whenever we take an, a new image, we can look up where's its nearest neighbor in this space, and get the 3D shape. So this is what you can get with this kind of approach, is to take from an input image here on the left, um, you can go and retrieve a shape and place it such that it um, aligns with what you actually see in the image, and that gives you the perception of the 3D object shape and structure. So, Again, these objects here in, that we just discussed, um, you know, they have no colors, right? So they're just geometry here. So if we're, uh, you know, in the modeling process when an artist creates 3D content, for instance, in a video game or for a movie, they usually go through this process where they take 
just a geometric shape, and then they add colors and textures on top of it in order to figure out what is the, the, the appearance of that object. And so this is um, a problem that we want to be able to also model with AI is given an input shape geometry, what kind of colors would work well on top of that shape? So the way that this is um, approached is that, in fact, again, we come to this notion of how we, how we actually teach the machines. So data that we have in 3D actually is not that great. You can see it doesn't look very realistic. Uh, whereas data that we have in 2D actually looks, looks much more realistic. So we want to be able to learn um, and teach machines how to generate 3D colors from just 2D images. So the way that this looks like is from uh, the shapes, we want to be able to produce some kind of colors on top of them that are, uh, look realistic. So we can, can do this in a generative model, which means that we can propose multiple different possibilities for colors on top of any shape geometry. Sorry, this is the, the video compression. I think it doesn't look quite like this. Um, and but there's multiple different examples that you can see of different kind of color possibilities that you might want to choose from if you're an artist creating um, a 3D model uh, that you would then put into like you know a video game or a movie. And so how can we color on 3D, right? So in, in 2D, we have images, and they're typically represented in pixels. That You see here, it's an array of, of colors. So in, in 3D, what we can do here uh, is take that array um, and map it onto the geometry of the mesh here. So here we have um, a mesh surface that's made of these little um, quadrilateral elements, and each one of them can be interpreted like a pixel in an image. Uh, and that, in that way, we can actually operate on the 3D surface instead of just in, in 2D in order to be able to get um, colors uh, in each of these mesh faces here. So what we do here is we produce colors on each of the mesh faces, and then we take virtual cameras here um, and take images of the shape that we've produced. So that produces these output rendered views. Um, and then we can play this game here where we have a deep network that takes a look at the rendered images that we created, and it takes a look at the real images from uh, you know, Google on the web, and it, it tries to guess which one is real and which one is fake. So if it's a, a network that can um, guess this well, then it knows what are the problems in what we've generated, what makes it look fake. And we take that information and we use it in order to generate stuff that looks less fake, um, exactly along these kinds of, of reasoning. Um, and, and this back and forth between the network that generates and then the network here that plays this, this game of real or fake allows us to eventually produce a generator that um, can, can produce views that are very similar uh, to the real images. So these are the kinds of results that you can get from the input shape geometry. These are a bunch of alternative methods um, that are also deep learning based in order to generate colors on, on the shapes. Um, and they're using a somewhat different representation. This kind of coloring on the mesh surface allows us to, to generate something with a pretty high um, realism in terms of the outputs. So we can also get um, another chair here with various different kinds of, of detail on the chair back and the chair seat. And this works also for not just chairs. We can do this for, for cars. And you can see the output here generates all of the colors on, on the car here, including you know, windows, wheels, um, bumper, and, and all of these details. We can learn to generate by um, having this, this AI figure out you know, how can we generate um, colors on these shapes that make them look like real images? 
So here's another example of a, a car that, that we generate here. Uh, from this input geometry, we can, we can get all of these colors um, on, on top of the car. And so because uh, we want to be able to generate multiple options, so this you can see moving from one option to another option, typically something that's more yellow colored to red, um, and, and that allows for multiple different possibilities if, if you are trying to create content um, and you can take a look and, and see what the different possibilities might be for a certain object. So what's kind of cool about the way that this generates is that you can see that we can generate the same kind of colors, the same style of coloring on all of these shapes um, at the same time, and, and similarly for all of these cars that kind of have the same kind of style, and we can move through uh, and, and give them different kinds of, of, of styles that are all consistent, and, and, and this um, is implicitly learned uh, in this way in order to uh, produce this kind of controllability of, of editing um, and generating realistic looking 3D shapes. So I th what's, what's also, I think, um, you know, next from, from here, I talked a lot about 3D and getting 3D, but um, you know, in, in real kind of scenarios, like the ones that we have here, the scenes that we have are not just 3D, they're in fact dynamic. Um, we have people that move around, objects that move around, um, and we are also looking at um, how we can understand dynamic movement, which if we go from 2D to 3D, we add in an extra dimensionality, which is uh, quite significant, and going from 3D to 4D, um, adds in yet another dimensionality in terms of the complexity of the, the data that's being re represented here. So this is a pretty cool challenge in terms of how to understand how things um, move over time. And so with that, I would um, like to conclude and to thank you guys for listening. Angie, thanks a lot for this wonderful talk and the amazing results. I always love them. So are there any questions? If you want, you can also ask in German, and I try my best to translate. <laughs> yeah. All right, so my question would be, how does this system perform with mirrors and glass? Does it recognize mm -hmm. it? Is it like, like a portal to another dimension? Because for, for us humans, it looks like it goes through, or does, how does the system in general uh, like work with so, something like that? That's a very good question. So I think you might have seen how these cars look like, because the windows are also, um, what's interesting here, the windows are very challenging on cars. Uh, in real images, we never see just the window, we usually see the environment reflected into the window. Uh, and that's exactly what you see here, is the, it's the way that we've set up this problem is that the machine learns to try to mimic environment reflections in windows, um, and it doesn't, completely succeed at doing it, which is why you see these funny kind of um, artifacts uh, the, of uh, bits of different kind of colors that you see in the windows. Um, and so that requires not just understanding shape and color, it requires understanding how light um, reflects and moves around in a scene. And so, yeah, um, recognizing the way that uh, stuff like glass or mirrors and stuff is is doable with this kind of um, approach, but uh, properly modeling it and handling, um, you know, how does the light actually reflect off of the car windows um, and turn into color, that's uh, uh, still a pretty big open challenge in terms of how we can get machines to understand the complexity of how light actually operates in a very complex environment. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the talk as well. Uh, I just want to ask you because um, it seems like this is a relatively easy process if it's uh, well developed. So 
I'm thinking about, for example, in game art, where usually um, when you want to create a model, you have to do it in Blender manually. Do you think at some point when this is working very uh, safely or correctly that it could, uh, at least in some cases, replace the classic 3D modeling? So the, the, much of the aim in this kind of work is to augment the content creation process. So a lot of the times, 3D artists will spend a lot of time on very tedious kind of tasks that aren't about artistic creativity, they're just about um, you know, ensuring that um, all of the uh, little bits of geometry, colors, and textures reflect um, what they envision in their minds. And so, um, yeah, when we can resolve some of these things, like um, you know, properly handling reflections in cart windows, then the aim would be that we can present this also in a content creation pipeline, then potentially an artist doesn't necessarily have to go and model something completely from scratch. They can leverage something like this to generate some multitude of possibilities. They can pick one and then refine it. It's, so it's not really meant to replace the, the artist pipeline, but it's definitely inspired by how can we help them um, you know, focus on interesting creative tasks. Okay, uh, thank you. And then there has been a maybe final question in the back. Uh, yeah, thanks. So first of all, uh, thanks for the amazing talk. Um, what I was asking myself, um, how do these algorithms perform under real time, if, if they <laughs> even do? Like. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good question. So we went through a bunch of different um, approaches. The, the first was designed specifically for real time and, and did run at 30 hertz. Um, some of these other approaches have, uh, we've been lazy and um, leveraged the advantage of having big compute and, and a decent amount of, of time, but they usually run fast, not necessarily just real time fast. So, you know, under a second. Um, in order to get pretty much all of the results that you've seen here. Um, but uh, I think in order to be able to, to do it in real time is cool because then you can actually get um, proper feedback. Like even waiting a second is kind of tedious for m many kinds of tasks when you want to interact with that kind of um, technology. So for sure, uh, that kind of interaction is, is also very important in these scenarios. So, if there is one more urgent final, final question, we can take it. Ah, okay, there seems to be one. No. Okay. Uh, just one thing. Um, you mentioned that uh, there could be an ambiguous interpretation of 2D images, um, but um, and you said that um, next you'll strive to identify or to work with dynamic images or 3D models. And is there also some potential risk because um, um, you could interpret a certain movement in an ambiguous way as well? And is, like, is this a problem um, when you um, will attack uh, the um, dynamic 3D models or not? I, I think it's more about can we model effectively the space of possibilities? Um, because humans are also very perceptible to these optical illusions. Uh, so we're good most of the time, but you sometimes you see this stuff where it's in fact a static image, but you kind of see your vision system sees stuff moving instead. Um, but you also have a, a good prior as a person to say, well, maybe that's not quite right. So that's the same kind of um, set, set of possibilities that we want to be able to uh, get AI to be able to, to learn as well. And so in a sense, kind of like generating these multiple different possibilities for how to understand color on a shape, um, we want to generate multiple different explanations when um, something is ambiguous. You know, if, if you happen to see some kind of movement, but uh, one arm is totally occluded and you can't see it, then you have to generate a set of plausible guesses as to what might happen and what's the more likely scenarios. Okay, so thanks, Angela, Thank you. again for that nice talk. <laughs> ja, und damit sind wir am Ende dieser Veranstaltung. Es tut mir leid, dass es ein bisschen länger gedauert hat, aber ich glaube, wir haben wirklich 
sechs sehr spannende Vorträge gesehen. Ich hoffe, Sie hatten ähnlich viel Spaß wie ich an dem Ganzen und ich würde jetzt damit die Veranstaltung schließen. Ich äh, wünsche Ihnen eine gute Heimfahrt und noch ein schönes Wochenende. Herzlichen Dank.